All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, here for our well, final session uh, before, before the break. Uh, we have Ben Powell uh, talking about copyrights, dark clouds, and I'll, uh, I'll leave him to tell you what that means. Please welcome Ben Powell. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to my presentation, Copyright Dark, uh, Copyrights of Dark Clouds, about the Optus and NRL uh, case that was handed down by the full bench of the Federal Court earlier this year and its uh, implications for cloud computing and um, quite serious implications. Got some feedback there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a disclaimer. Yeah, it's my own private view. Um, it's not anything to do with my work. I have to put that there. And it's not legal advice either, so um, if, you're, if you're intending on uh, deploying a cloud-based PVR, um, talk to a lawyer. <laughs> don't just download these slides and sort of go, yeah, but Ben said, <laughs> don't do that. You'll find yourself in trouble. What's so, right? sorry? What's your right? uh, <laughs> No, no. Um, I, I don't provide advice on this sort of stuff, so um, yeah, it's uh, not legal advice. Um, now, I've talked to a lot of people um, in the last couple of days and um, everyone was asking me uh, about my previous talk at um, LCA last year, which was about the, the IONET case and, and a lot of people didn't know what actually ended up happening because at the time it was in the High Court um, and the decision hadn't been handed down. So I thought, oh well, I'll put in an extra slide here just, just for the benefit of, of people who didn't actually know what happened there, um, just to sort of round off what happened last year. Um, the High Court found in favour of IONET. IONET didn't um, infringe, oh, authorise infringement, that is authorised in the sense of the Copyright Act. Um, and the, the High Court judgement in that case um, actually was a complete slap down to, to AFACT. Um, in the case beforehand they came so close to, you, you basically got as close to winning as you can without winning and then the High Court basically undid all of that. So. Um, it's a cautionary tale in why litigation is, is probably not the best way of dealing with things. You could, you could end up losing. So on to this presentation. Um, I'm just going to... Uh, it's designed for non-lawyers and I hope that I don't use any terms that um, uh, are sort of over lawyers, lawyery. So if I start speaking in Latin, um, put your hand up and sort of go, what does that mean? Um, Obviously we still need to talk about the law and unfortunately this section of the Copyright Act is, in my opinion, fairly badly drafted, so um, I'll try and explain it to you, uh, but it is a little complex. Um, so I've broken the presentation into four parts. Uh, firstly, I want to talk about, a little bit about the history of the particular amendment that was important in this case, that's the time shifting amendment. Um, then we'll talk about the, the Act itself and, um, and how that works. As I said, it, I don't think this section is particularly well drafted, so We'll try and explain it. Uh, then we'll go to the actual case, which is uh, Optus and the uh, National Rugby League Investments. Um, there are a couple of other parties to the case as well, the AFL and Telstra, so we'll hear a bit about them as well. Um, and then we'll talk about the implications of the judgment, and there are some pretty serious implications. Um, it's okay to ask questions, particularly if you've got a quick clarification question, but if it's sort of a bit more complex, we'll have plenty of time at the end to discuss it. Um, so. It's okay to ask for clarification, but otherwise just, just leave it to the end. We'll have heaps of time, as long as I get through all this stuff. So, so why are we even talking about it? Why is it important? Well, it's actually the first examination of this um, amendment that was made in 2006, uh, the home recording exception to copyright infringement. Um, and it has a pretty serious impact on new models of delivering content, uh, particularly content in the cloud. And it may actually have wider implications for cloud computing. It, it's likely to affect innovation and competition in, these, uh, in this particular space. And it also um, really undermines, in, in my opinion, undermines the technological neutrality of the Copyright Act, and that's, that's a bad thing. So it's quite an important case in the context of uh, Australian copyright law. So we'll just go to a little bit of history. So, as I said, it's a, it was an amendment that was made in 2006. Um, and there was no, before then, there was actually no uh, exception in the Copyright Act uh, to time shift, and that, that's the important one uh, for this case. So you couldn't actually record a television program for um, watching at a later date. So, you know, we had the video recorder you know, in the 80s, I suppose, is when they became quite uh, popular. And so, you know, all those episodes of Full House and Saved by the Bell that you made a copies of, that was infringement. 
It's probably bad for other reasons as well. <laughs> um, there was no, no exception for format shifting. Um, unfortunately, the format shifting provisions in the Australian Copyright Act are really quite complex. Uh, format shifting is when you obviously change the format of something, so you make an MP3 out of your um, CD. And there are still, it's still quite a messy area, that one. Um, and you couldn't uh, copyright, copy an article for personal use, so you couldn't make a photocopy. So you know, while you are at uni, you were busily copyright infringing, but you probably knew that. <laughs> Um, so, unlike in the US, um, we don't actually have a fair use provision. Um, fair use is a defence that you can raise to copyright infringement, it's a general defence. We don't have that in Australia. Basically, you've got to point to an exception in the Copyright Act. So, there's no general defence, you actually have to find a part of the Copyright Act that authorises what you're doing. So, essentially there's a presumption that you, you've infringed, unless you can point to that. And Optus and NRL is a case dealing with, with an exception, one of these exceptions, uh, the time-shifting one, as I discussed earlier. So, in the US, uh, there was a very famous case called Sony and Betamax. Probably, probably heard about this case. Um, and essentially it was a fair use case. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's essentially legalised the, the video recorder. But um, there have been no Australian analogues, no pun intended. <laughs> Uh, although we, we have had um, citations or over to comments, an over to comment is when um, a judge engages in general discussion uh, about things that are not necessarily the, the central issue of the case. So there's been some over to discussion in other cases that cite Betamax with approval. So that was sort of the indication of where it might go if it was ever taken to court. And uh, so we didn't actually formally encode it into Australian law until 2006, so 22 years. Be real quick on this one. So we've had 22 years of copyright infringement by Australians. All those videos you made, yeah, yes, sorry. Oh, um, obiter is when uh, there is a discussion in a case by a justice. Like, so he might be talking about copyright in general and might talk about other things um, that aren't central to the case. So they'll make the judgment on whatever the central issue is, say mod chipping of Sony PlayStations, that's the, the case that I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of obiter remarks. They might actually have some more broad discussion of copyright law. And so, well, that, that's not a precedent. Um, what it is, is it's an indication of, of the justice's thinking on that, that particular issue. Um, so, yeah, as I said, uh, 22 years of copyright infringement. Um, so all those videos um, that, that you made, all, all infringing. So, yeah, it's taken us a while to catch up. And <laughs> when we did, we didn't do it very well. Um, so fast forward to today. Um, Optus, what, what, what happened in this case was Optus was offering a time-shifting service uh, called TV Now. Um, and, and what that did was it meant that a user could select a program from an EPG, so see that The Simpsons is on tonight, and so you click on that and it makes a copy for you. And it, makes four, it actually made four recordings, um, and they were all in different formats, uh, so you could watch them on your iPad or your desktop or whatever. And uh, they were stored on Optus' servers in the cloud. Uh, then you could access them on your devices. Uh, and on Apple devices, and this is where I suppose it upset the football codes, um, on Apple devices you could basically watch it as little as two minutes after you made the recording, um, which gave you a virtual live stream. So if there was football on and you were making a copy of the football, you could watch it with a two minute delay. Now, this really annoyed the uh, football codes. Um, well, for the benefit of um, uh, anyone who's not from Australia, uh, NRL is the National Rugby League and the AFL is the Australian Football League, they're two most popular codes in Australia. And that, that actually sold the exclusive mobile broadcast rights to Telstra and it was rumoured that it was around about $100 million a pop. So it's not small change and you can see why they were a little upset. Because they saw that the, the near live broadcaster un, undermined the value of that. So they figured, well, you know, we can't sell it for $100 million if people are accessing a two minute delay. It's, it's not, as, not as valuable. And they made all sorts of noise uh, in the press about how Optus were a bunch of thieves and all sorts of terrible things they said about Optus. In fact, they were, they said things, a lot of bad things about Optus that Optus took them to, uh, to court. And there was a trade practices case, so I won't go into that here, but um, 
it, there, was, there was a lot of uh, noise in the press about it and inevitably it was going to end up in, in court. So what Optus did was uh, they preempted it and uh, actually took the codes to court. So you notice that it's Optus in NRL. So Optus in, in this case was actually the plaintiff. They're the, they were the person doing the suing. So what were they upset about? Well, as I said before, it was the exclusive right to communicate the broadcast to the public. And, and that's actually contained within several sections of the Copyright Act. And that's just a quote out of the, the case, the, uh, the federal court case from Justice Rarez. Um, and, and it's that right that they were upset about. That was the one they were selling to Telstra, and that was the one that they saw was being undermined by TV Now. So why did Optus think they could get away with this? Well, they were relying on the time-shifting exception. This is the one that allows you to record things for watching at a later date. Um, so there's the actual thing there, as you can see, it's, it's not particularly well written. Uh, but essentially what it means is you can make a copy of a broadcast and you can watch it at a more convenient time. As long as that broadcast copy is made for private and domestic use. That's the important part of it. Now, there's a further exception in part two uh, that had to be put into the Copyright Act. As I said, they, they didn't do a great job of drafting this because um, without section two, section one doesn't work. And they actually had section one in there before that. And uh, there's a whole heap of different types of copyright in a broadcast and music and all sorts of stuff. And um, so without saying all the other stuff is included as well, um, section one doesn't work. So that's why the section two is there. And of course, as all good laws have, an exception to the exception. So you... <laughs> so that's the exception for time shifting, unless you do it for all of these commercial reasons. So if it's sold or let for hire or by way of trade offered or exposed for sale, all those sort of commercial things. So it just means that if you make a copy for private and domestic use and then you take it down to the local cinema and play it for, for the public, well, it doesn't apply. So what does private and domestic use mean? Lovely circular definition. Private and domestic use means private and domestic use. It's good. <laughs> on or off the premises. So, I mean, it's the dictionary meaning of private and domestic. Um, and uh, the important part is on or off the premises. So it, it doesn't tie it purely to the box under your telly. It, um, it allows you to watch it on mobile devices on the road. So it's quite an important sort of um, distinction. And it goes to the heart of, you know, who makes the recordings. So um, if it's an individual making the recording, uh, it's likely to be private and domestic use, unless they then take it down to the cinema and play it, obviously, but it's likely to be private and domestic use. If, if Optus makes it, large multinational corporation, you're going to have trouble arguing that that's private or domestic use. So it's kind of important who made it. And that was one of the issues in the case. So three important issues. Firstly, does the home recording exception apply? And who is the maker of the recording? Um, so if it's Optus, Optus as I said, it's um, unlikely to be private or domestic use. And the third part is, was it communicated to the public? So to infringe copyright, you've got to communicate the um, article to the public. So Optus said, well, it was users making the copies, not us. And so the home recording exception applied. The NRL and others said, no, no, Optus owned the equipment, Optus made the recordings, the recordings were then made available to the public. The exception doesn't apply. It's copyright infringement. So they cross, as I said, Optus sued them and then they cross-claimed, saying that it was uh, copyright infringement. So what did the full, ben uh, the full federal court say? Sorry, not the full federal court, the federal court. All copyright um, uh, cases start in the federal court in Australia. Okay, so on the maker of the recording, um, rights holders, as I said before, they argued that, look, you know, because Optus owns and operates all the equipment, it's irrelevant what the users are doing. Optus is the one who is making the recording. Now, Justice Rare has rejected that argument. He basically said, look, if the user does not click on record, no films will be brought into existence that he or she can play back later. So he really focused on the agency of the user, the person pressing the record button. It didn't really matter what sort of happened in the cloud. What mattered is the person saying, I'm making a recording. And he said that it, basically Section 111 had a broad meaning. Um, making a film or recording is concerned with the creation by one person of a copy of a second person's original work, so that, as a result, a film or recording is bought somehow 
into, the, into existence by the first person's action. So again, it's really focusing on the agency of the user, not what the system is actually doing. Uh, you know, as he says, it was brought somehow into existence, doesn't matter. What matters is it's the person who's pressing the button. And this is consistent with a very, um, very famous case in Australian copyright law uh, called Morehouse. In fact, if you read any case, you'll find Morehouse is cited. And what happened in Morehouse was that um, libraries had uh, photocopiers and uh, rights holders said, well, libraries were infringing copyright because people were making copies. Uh, and on this particular issue, of the primary infringement, uh, the court found that uh, it was the users who were the primary infringers. So the people pressing the button were the people who were, who were um, the primary infringers. Uh, unfortunately, the libraries were found guilty of copyright infringement, um, authorising copyright infringement, so a different reason. But um, on this point, it's consistent with Morehouse. And the other good thing about this uh, finding is it's technology neutral. He doesn't really talk about how the thing was brought into existence. He talks about the agency of the user. And of course, you know, in, this, in the TV Now situation, the user made a copy and that they could only access their own copy. So it wasn't like um, 100 people pressed record on The Simpsons and there was one copy of The Simpsons that was made and 100 people then had access to it. You, you actually only had access to your own copy. Four copies, actually. Different formats. So Justice Rare has found that Section 111 applied. Now he said that also that making the recording was for private and domestic use. And to, to back that up, he pointed to Optus's terms and conditions which said you will only use these recordings for private or domestic use. So the intention was there that it was private or domestic. Um, and because the maker of the recording could only review the recording that they had made, um, then it was for private and domestic use. As I said before, if 100 people wanted to watch the same thing, it didn't make one copy and allow 100 people to access it. It made your copy and you played back your copy. So it was for private and domestic use. If it was one copy and hundreds of people having access to it, I think you'd have a lot of difficulty saying that, that the time shifting exception applied. He also said that the near live streaming, which was what was upsetting the football code so much, uh, also fell under the exception. Basically, a time more convenient didn't actually limit the time. So it was any time more convenient. Two minutes later, that's more convenient. Now, was it communicated to the public? Well, Rare has found that, uh, Justice Rare has found that the users were the ones that were doing the communication. So, same sort of reasoning. Users were the one making the copy because they were pressing the record button. Well, the users are the one communicating because they're the one pressing the play button. And essentially, they're communicating it to themselves because it's their own copy. They press record, they made the copy, they press play, that copy was played back to them. So, even though Rare has, Justice Rare has found that they were the public because they could form part of the broadcast audience. Because they were communicating it to themselves, it doesn't really make any sense to say, well, it's communication to the public. It's a private communication with yourself, I suppose. So, NRL lost. TV Now was found not to infringe copyright. It was a big win for Optus. And the reaction was swift. So, in the political sphere, Prime Minister Julia Gillard said, we will urgently consider options here. I think we're all concerned about what this could mean for our great sporting codes. And it was an unexpected development. And in fact, um, the then sports minister, Mark R. Bibb, uh, intimated that um, because the codes weren't able to make huge amounts of cash selling off these exclusive broadcast rights, that the codes then wouldn't invest in children's sport and it would be the end of children's sport as we knew it. So. <laughs> Uh, some would say that's a little bit, yeah, a bit of a hyperbole there, but you know, <laughs> they're all upset. Um, the opposition communications spokesman uh, also sided with the codes by saying that the uh, ruling has effectively destroyed the economic value of the so-called online live broadcast rights. So the government and the opposition both uh, were on the side of the, the codes in this um, particular decision. And, oh, it's cut off the bottom of that quote. It's a good quote. <laughs> The Greens communications spokesman, Scott Ludlam, said it's interesting to watch the commercial intermediaries trying to protect their exclusive rights to profit from sports broadcasting when all that has happened is that technological innovation has swamped an obsolete business model. Words to ruminate on. And Optus appealed. Uh, so they went to the full bench of the Federal Court, uh, who overturned the Federal Court's decision, unfortunately. Uh, they actually found that Optus was the maker. 
And they argued that you really couldn't divorce Optus's role from the system. Um, essentially, they said, look, it's not apparent to us why a person who designs and operates a wholly automated copying system ought to, as of course, not be treated as a maker of an infringing copy, where the system itself is configured designedly so as to respond to a third party command. Now, if you, you know, unpack that, because it's, you know, it's judges speak. Um, essentially what they're saying is, look, because it was so automated, it didn't really matter. You know, yes, you press record, but there was a whole heap of stuff that happened that the user wasn't even aware of. So, for example, Optus made four copies. Um, now, that was so users could look at it in varying formats. But they're saying, look, <laughs> you know, they didn't know that. They, they had no agency around making four copies. I mean, maybe if they'd said, I want to make four copies and they had a lot more to do with it and the system wasn't quite so automated, then maybe you could make that argument. They basically said, look, the system is not really, as they said, you know, it's characterised as not merely making available system to another who uses it to copy a broadcast, rather it captures copies and stores and makes available for reward a program for later viewing by another. So, you know, they're basically saying, look, the whole system is a copying system. It's designed for copying, it's designed for making copies. Because it's so automated, it's really, it's not, um, it's too simplistic to say, to, to fall on that agency argument from, from uh, Justice Rarers. It's far too simplistic, you need to take into account you know, the way that it works. This is unfortunate. Um, so, yeah, Optus lost. Um, they basically, was, it was found that TV Now infringed copyright and they withdrew it from the market. Well, actually, they withdrew it from the market after they applied for special leave to appeal to the High Court and it was denied. Now, in Australia, you don't have a, an appeal as a matter of right to the High Court. You actually have to apply for special leave, and um, so you have a hearing in front of the High Court where they decide whether they want to hear the case. And it was quite a surprise, actually, um, that they didn't. Um, they actually said that there was um, little chance of success. Um, so the federal court, the full bench decision stands, and, and we're stuck with, um, with that decision. Uh, essentially, that throws the ball right back into the legislature's court. Uh, they're essentially saying, we're not going to deal with it. It needs to be dealt with by the parliament. So what hap what's happened? Well, that's created considerable uncertainty around the provision of cloud-based services. Already TV Now has exited the market. Um, there were several other PVR systems that were poised to enter the Australian market. In fact, I think one of them had begun operations um, and then they pulled it. So any of those sort of TV Now style of services, uh, they've ceased operation. Um, now the full bench was very careful to try and constrain their, um, the, their findings to the, to the facts, basically saying it's, it's, it's Optus's system only, they didn't make it sort of very broad. But, you know, the problem is, is uh, if you're thinking about bringing a PVR to the market, um, you don't want to have to sort of look at the internals of yours and the internals of the way the Optus TV Now system worked and work out, you know, is it sufficiently different? And then I'll test it in court and that could go wrong, it's very expensive. So, you know, it's, it, it does make it difficult because that technical neutrality is gone. You have to really look at the way that your system works, which is, which is very unfortunate because you know, you, you're not going to know until it goes back to court and no one wants to bring something to market that they're going to get sued over. And the thing is, is that because we're now looking at, remo well now that the technological neutrality is removed, you kind of need to look at other systems that might fall under these same arguments. So as I've said before, you know, PVR systems, they're, they're gone. Um, it's unlikely anyone's going to bring that to market, it's, it's, it's very risky. But you could also have automated uploading of media to cloud systems. So, you know, you've, you've got a TV card in your, in your computer, you're playing, you know, you're recording the football, it's recording it, it's uploading it to Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that, and then you can access it on uh, your mobile device as well. That might actually fall into the, the argument there. So, you know, things that people just normally do could now be subject to litigation. If it's a system that you've set up yourself, so you've bought the device, you've set it up, it's running inside your house. Because, I mean, I can understand what this one was happening all in their cloud, right? Well, that's, yeah, that's the question. D does, it, does it extend to that? And, I mean, it would come down to who's making the copy. So, is it you making the copy as the agent? Yeah, you own all the, all the kit and all the stuff, but there's still a copy being made on Google servers if you're using Google Drive. Um, does that fall under the same sort of reasoning? Um, I don't know. 
Sorry? Is it too user friendly? <laughs> well, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> maybe if we made it really hard, then no one would understand how it worked. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it might, it might actually not, um, it might be fine, but then we don't know until it goes to court again. We don't want that. And the other question, uh, with Optus, like Optus was storing multiple copies. Oh, sorry. Um, Optus was storing multiple copies. Yeah. Um, Optus was storing multiple copies, and in this day and age with, you know, storage costs, etc., that sounds like a very strange thing to do. So is it, you know, is it, does it feel fairly obvious that they were doing that on purpose to try and get around the legislation? Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not to get around the legislation, to fall under the exception. Yeah. So, th yeah, yeah, totally, of, of course. That's the reason why uh, they, they made that argument in, in court, and they actually said when they lost, look, we were really surprised because we had an army of lawyers looking at that, and they assured us it was under the exception. <laughs> Um, actually, a lot of people were very surprised that, um, that they lost because it seemed to be the very thing that that sort of exception would allow. Um, so, yeah, no, no they, they totally designed it that way specifically so it fell under that exception. <laughs> it's not their fault. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it could actually extend to other systems that we're already using now. And, and of course, any future systems, problematic. So, to address the uncertainty, um, the government has requested a review by the Australian Law Reform Commission. Um, it addresses the Optus and NRL question directly. So, firstly, it says, uh, it addresses a whole heap of other issues as well, and um, if you can find the submissions to it um, on, the, on the internet. So, it covers quite a bit of copyright law, but the questions that we're interested in for the purposes of this presentation is question five, is Australian copyright law impeding the development or delivery of cloud-based computing services? I think we could speculate that that's a yes. Um, in question six, should exceptions in the Copyright Act be amended or new exceptions created to account for new cloud computing services, and if so, how? Well, I think the first part of that question we can say is, yeah, probably a good idea to do that. How? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Now, the review closed on the 16th of November last year. Um, and the report is due in November this year. And the next line, likely to be after the federal election. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it can definitely be after the federal election because it's uh, going to happen on the 14th of September. Maybe auspiciously on the uh, Rugby League Grand Final day. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Um, so the, the uh, report's going to be handed to whoever forms government. Um, so it will either be the current Gillard government or the opposition led by Tony Abbott. Um, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't bear thinking of. Um, and really the only way that we can deliver certainty is, is via legislative change. Um, there's no more grounds for appeal. I mean, unless someone brings something else to market and then we go through this process again, really, we need to, to change the law. So what did Optus say in their ALRC submission? Um, it's a big quote, but it's a good one. Uh, it says, if Australia wants to be at the forefront of the digital world, then it needs to either lead or at least stay in step with the rest of the world. More and more data is being stored in the cloud, and there seems to be no logical reason why there should be any distinction between storing the data on a hard drive of a DVD recorder as opposed to remotely in the cloud. Because essentially what's happened is, is yeah, we've, we've legalised the, the DVD player underneath your, um, or DVD recorder underneath your TV, but we've actually made it really uncertain for any future developments, so we've legalised the past. In both instances, a third party has more than likely been responsible for providing the storage facility. Yeah, you bought your DVD player from, uh, DVD recorder from Harvey Norman or whatever. Or well, you're leasing it as part of uh, your contract with your ISP. Yeah, sure. indeed, indeed. And, and the only real distinction is that the recorder received its um, commercial benefit up front, so you bought it from Harvey Norman or you, you're leasing it. Um, in the sense that um, you, know, you, you get it on an ongoing basis. Um, the same with the cloud-based uh, storage provider, you pay a subscription. So you know, what's the difference, really? It's a good point. What is the difference? Um, so Optus also said, look, you know, we really need to get end user focused about this. We need to look at the way that people are using media today and, and allow the law to accommodate that. Um, you know, legitimately using it, obviously. <laughs> Um, they also argued that you know, we, we need to restore technological neutrality, and that's, that's really important for certainty in this area. Um, and we need international consistency. In fact, just before this case went to court, there was a case in Singapore, Cartoon Network, um, that uh, tested a, a similar system, and it was found that it didn't infringe copyright. Um, 
And Singapore's got very similar copyright laws to us, so it was, it was quite surprising that um, the full bench of the federal court found the way they did. And the thing is, if you don't have international consistency, Australians will just start using services overseas or infringing copyright by using BitTorrent or whatever. And that's not good for anyone. So there were quite a few submissions in favour of change, and there's just a few of them there. Um, I think Google makes a good point. Australia's narrow private copying exceptions run the risk of approving yesterday's technology without affording the flexibility to embrace tomorrow's cloud-based services. So you can see that essentially a lot of people were sort of agreeing with what Optus was saying. Really, we've got to make sure that we create certainty for these new systems. So the Digital Alliance said Australian copyright law exposes cloud service providers to greater risk of liability for copyright infringement and greater legal uncertainty than competitor countries. So, I mean, it's the point I was making before, yeah, we've got to have that international consistency, otherwise, really, we're giving a competitive advantage for innovation around cloud-based services to, to other countries. Um, no one's going to develop stuff here if they think they're going to get sued. Yeah, it's, a, it's dealing with slightly different issues. But yes, I'm, I'm aware of the, the case that's going through the court at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so it's, I mean, it, there are cases going around uh, about cloud, cloud storage all over the place. So there's, you know, the mega upload one in, in New Zealand, which has been a, a bit of a stuff up. <laughs> yeah, dog's breakfast, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, all of these systems are actually being tested at the moment um, and there's quite a bit of uncertainty and this, this case obviously adds to the uncertainty. So what do the AFL have to say? Well, I think, I think this pretty much sort of sums up a lot of rights holders' views of innovation. Um, the AFL, who was one of the parties to the case, um, as well as the NRL, and they said, um, in particular, the AFL is concerned that the emphasis on technological innovation without recognising and maintaining established and proper protections for rights holders is inappropriate and harmful. Now, harmful to whom, I suppose? <laughs> the AFL is firmly of the view that encouraging new technologies and developments cannot be at the expense of existing property rights and the commercialisation of those rights by rights holders. So it's a very conservative approach and unfortunately it's been the approach that's been taken by many rights holders when it comes to technological innovation. Uh, really, they, they figure that they want their piece of the pie before you know, we allow any, anyone to sort of innovate in the space, which is unfortunate. So there are a few others. Um, AFACT, our good friends, they said, um, there's no evidence that Australian copyright law has been impeding the development or delivery of legitimate or appropriate cloud-based computing services. So obviously they had a view on TV now as not being uh, legitimate or appropriate. Yes, yes they did. Different, different issue though, uh, that's what I was talking about before. It's, uh, that was an authorisation um, issue, so a different part of the Copyright Act, but yeah, they... You were along the lines of their views on copyright innovation and that sort of thing, or other words? Well, yeah, I mean, they obviously have a view, um, and that wasn't upheld in the High Court uh, when it came to authorisation, so they're hoping that this view is upheld when it comes to exceptions. <coughs> Well, I mean, uh, you know, to, to them, of course, you know, they're, they're representing their members um, who have this view, so I suppose it is legitimate and appropriate from, from that point of view. <laughs> um, yeah, they said there's considerable evidence of development of cloud-based services within the existing copyright laws. Well, I don't know whether that's really a sustainable argument, but you know, that's what they believe. Uh, Telstra, who is also another um, uh, party to the case, uh, said that they believe the decision is a positive one for the protection of intellectual property rights and cloud computing as a commercial offer. It provides various stakeholders with guidance and recognises the delicate balance of interests. In other words, they get paid. Well, you could say that might be based on the commercial interest that they have in the exclusive broadcast rights to mobile devices. You could hold that view. <laughs> Sorry, the one thing that did confuse me about this case was the fact that the TV network itself wasn't involved. Now, as far as I can remember, Optus actually recorded Channel 9's broadcasts. Yes. So that we, and, which, and, and these broadcasts can carry a, what, a 50-year broadcast copyright on them? 
So in, in essence, what they're doing is they're taking, they're, they were infringing originally on Channel 9's broadcast. Copyright. Well, I think they were more worried uh, about TV now undermining the mobile, the exclusive mobile broadcast rights. Um, Free-to-air television, it's, 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 it's governed by a whole heap of laws, um, particularly anti-siphoning. So the, the reason why uh, you, know, you do get it carried on free-to-air television is because laws prevent them from selling it to Foxtel. So uh, th there's a different sort of economic structure around free-to-air broadcast than there is around the exclusive mobile rights. Essentially, they have an exclusive right to, to, to deliver on mobile platforms. So obviously, you, know, you can monetize that however you like. Um, if, if that right seemed to exist. So um, but with free-to-air broadcasting, it's slightly different because there's a whole heap of different regulations around that. Um, Channel 9 got more people watching their ads. Well, yes, that too. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it, it, they, they probably could have sued, but they didn't. Yeah, uh, there's another question just up there. Sorry. One more and then I'll keep going. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understand this. I'm from the U.S., so I'm not totally familiar with the case. Yep. So if I was using TV now um, to record a sports broadcast, um, is would the AFL or whoever actually get any money whatsoever out of that? In other words, did Optus have any um, rights to that at all, or were they snagging something that somebody else had paid the rights for and were a third party that weren't paying anything whatsoever? Uh, yeah, uh, kind of like that. Um, it was free-to-air broadcasts that they were capturing. Uh, so in Australia we have a regime of anti-siphoning for major sports events. So it means that they are broadcast on, they have to be broadcast on free-to-air. Um, so they were snagging the free-to-air rights. So it wasn't like they were snagging pay TV or cable TV rights and rebroadcasting them. I think they would have got into a whole mess of trouble if they did that. But this is free-to-air television, so it's, it's free broadcasting. You just pick it up on your normal telly. So um, yes, they were rebroadcasting something that Channel 9 had the rights to. But because it's a different economic sort of value proposition when you're dealing with the free-to-air broadcast, um, Channel 9 didn't get involved in the case. Um, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, at some point the copyright holder, I, I don't, I'm probably taking a contrarian view, but at some point the copyright holder has to make some money on it or otherwise they stop producing the content. So. Sure. Yep. Does the recording still have the original free-to-air adverts? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just a straight record. So, yeah, I mean, look, Channel 9 still getting their ad ads watched. And that's, that's the way they're making them, their money out of the, the um, broadcast. Um, guys, if, if, if we've only got uh, less than 10 minutes left, oh, we might let well. um, Ben finish his talk and we'll keep questions for the end. Okay. There's only a little bit, little bit more to go. Um, so, yeah, we've got to change the law. Um, that's what it boils down to. We need to change it to get certainty. Um, and I think, look, Justice Rear has put it very well uh, that the purpose of the exceptions, uh, the time shifting exception, was to accommodate to some degree the law to the realities of modern life. So it was basically, it's what people want to do, it's, it's how people want to actually access content. Um, and so the law, as it was written, in his opinion, uh, was meant to accommodate that. Um, but the full bench of the federal court decision basically limits the amendments to past technology. So yeah, they, they legalised your DVD recorder under your telly, um, but any of this sort of cloud-based um, uh, storage or cloud-based recording is right out. Um, so I think we need to start revisiting the idea of fair use, and it's a, it was a question that was brought up in the ALRC review. Um, so a general defence of fair use, um, so we don't have to rely so much on exceptions. Um, I think, in my opinion, I think that's actually created a quite an innovative um, uh, environment in, in the US, although there is quite a bit of uncertainty about what fair use actually covers and what it actually means, and that has created quite a considerable amount of litigation, um, it's, it's better than relying on exceptions. Um, we really need to restore the technological neutrality. We, we don't want to be looking at the internals of our systems and trying to work out, uh, is, is this 
you know, the sort of thing that's kind of like TV now that I might get sued for, or is it so different? You, know, you don't want to be asking those questions. You want to know what, what the law actually covers. And if you do that, we're going to encourage technological innovation. And if we get better technological innovation, we'll get better access to content in Australia. And that will reduce infringement. And you know, really, that's what we want. We want to actually reduce infringement. Helps everyone. So what can we do about it? Well, as I said, industry can innovate around the facts of the Optus case. The, the, the court really did try and restrict the uh, findings to the TV Now system. Um, however, as I said, that, that there are still a lot of risks. You, you really have to look at the internals of your system. Um, it means that Australia will be left out of innovation in the cloud, um, which is a bad thing uh, for all sorts of economic reasons, as well as the fact that it leads to lack of access to content and increased infringement, which just doesn't help anyone. So what can you do to affect change? Well, it is definitely a federal election year. You've got until September the 14th. Um, you can lobby your MP. You can be guaranteed that the football codes have been busily doing that. Um, and because it's a federal election year, your MP will probably be quite interested in hearing from you. They are interested in hearing from constituents. You can ring their office. You can send them a letter. You can even organise to meet with them. Their staff are always very friendly. Um, it's worthwhile doing. You can ask them what their party's stance is on copyright law. Uh, they probably won't be able to tell you over the phone, <laughs> but they'll, they'll be able to send you uh, some material which, which can help you inform your vote um, on September the 14th. And you can suggest changes recommended by the ALRC submissions, uh, probably the ones that are more on Optus' side than the AFL. I mean, it depends. If you think the AFL is right, you can also uh, lobby them that way. Not whether the AFL really needs a lot of help. <laughs> but it's a, it's a good time to actually get involved and start lobbying your MP or your senator. Because um, basically until the Copyright Act reflects what people do in their ordinary course of business and rights holders stop railing against change, uh, infringement is going to be a central feature of Australia's digital economy. And that's ultimately what the problem is. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, did Optus at any point consider enforcing a playback delay? Uh, would that not have solved the whole problem? Uh, no, it wouldn't have. Um, it, it might have not upset the um, rights holders, so they might not have got sued if they just sort of thought, ah, oh, we might just stick that in there. But I think actually it would have made matters worse because then they really are involved in the making of the recording. They're actually interfering with the way the recording is being made. I, I think it would actually have made the, made the situation worse. I mean, yeah, it might not have, you know, the, the, the football codes might have decided, oh, well, we'll let that one fly because it's, you know, delayed by a few hours um, and not sued and, you know, then we wouldn't be here. Um, but uh, I think as far as the law is concerned, it would have made problems worse. Uh, hi, Ben. Hi. hi. Um, Telstra or Foxtel have a mobile app that allows you to schedule recording of stuff from your PVR, including, I believe, the free-to-air free channels that they carry. Do you see that as being fundamentally different as providing the agency by which the user can action a recording uh, remotely to what Optus provided? No. I don't think it's so, different at all. So <laughs> is, is, there not, is there not a case to be made that that should be tested uh, against Telstra's implementation as well and maybe hold them to the same standards that they try to hold other people to. Maybe, but who's going to sue them? Um, you know, the football code's quite happy. They paid $100 million for the rebroadcast of mobile rights, so they're making their money. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't actually see a difference with uh, things like TiVo, for example, but the, the, the issue with TiVo is that that's actually got all, all the content is licensed because it's owned by a broadcaster. So I think, yeah, highly likely that those things fall under the same problems. But, um, yeah, until someone sues, then we don't really know. But I think, yeah, I think there is no difference. Okay. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here, but probably the, the biggest one is, in this issue, is it perhaps more looking at the ownership of the equipment and the 
ownership of the, the, the devices that do the automating as opposed to the destination of the content. In this example, Optus own or lease the cloud infrastructure from somewhere, ergo they own it. They design the systems that do the recording, they own it, you are paying a subscriptions fee to something that, that they own. Whereas with the, the, the PVR that sits underneath your, your television, you own that. So you're initiating that, someone has sold that to you, the, the third party that gave that to you is no longer involved, ergo you fall under the exception. Would, do you think that the ownership of the equipment is the issue here or do you think it's more a technical, technological uh, misunderstanding from the people who have made the decisions? Uh, well, what I think <laughs> is that, um, look, you know, th there should be no difference between your PVR under your, your TV and, or, or an Optus cloud-based service. However, the full bench of the federal court disagrees with this, and um, they, they did make a big deal about the fact that Optus was the owner of all the equipment. Um, you know, that, that's always going to be problematic when you're talking about the cloud, um, because, well, it's the cloud, you're not going to own it. Uh, it's going to be owned by someone else, it's going to be hosted somewhere else. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't see the difference. I, I think that the, the, the exception to me is, is fairly clear in that respect, but full just, bench disagrees. Just following under that, sorry, just yeah. to, to deal with the ownership issue, wouldn't that then mean that any equipment, if, if, if the issue that the um, full bench court is, is focusing on is the ownership of the equipment, wouldn't that then mean that any equipment that is leased or rented or under some sort of a loan agreement to a private individual, you don't own that, ergo, would this ruling potentially apply to that situation? Uh, potentially, but I'd say unlikely. Um, mainly because you are in control of the entire copying system. So you've got ownership and control of it. So it's not, as I said, it's not like you just borrowed someone's stuff um, and made recordings on it. The stuff did all the recording for you and that was owned by someone else. So um, it, it, potentially, but I don't think so. Then you're guilty of theft, right? yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. Well, theft is a lesser crime than copyright infringement. <laughs> well, uh, no, that's, that's not true. Um, uh, theft is a crime and copyright infringement is a civil action. So that, they are quite different. Yeah, yeah I, look, I mean, th there is potential for criminal... criminal um, uh, acts that you know are done in copyright, but um, yeah, generally it's it's a civil matter. Generally, um, do you mean legal ownership or beneficial ownership? Uh, of what? Of the device making the recording. Um, I don't think they really made any distinction about the types of ownership. They really were talking about the, the way that the um, the machine worked, who was, who was actually making the recording. So I don't think it really would make all that much difference, even if you had a beneficial interest in it. Uh, coming back to um, some specifics around the Optus case, at any point were Optus required to prove that each recording was individual to a customer? Oh, yeah, also, that, that were they required thing. to prove who the customer was? Is the customer the holder of the account or is the customer an individual? Uh, those issues weren't deeply, th they were agreed facts, so it wasn't really deeply analysed, but um, uh, it, w it was agreed that um, uh, essentially, you know, the, the person was accessing a copy that was made for them. Um, that was an agreed fact, so. Yeah. It's it, just, again, some of that could have been argued given the nature of storage, deduplication, etc. There may have actually only been one copy or one of the four, uh, of the four copies made for 40 people, there may actually be one copy stored. But, but that wasn't... That, that that wasn't it didn't what, go to that level. Well, no, I mean, Optus explained how they, their system worked and, and they agreed. So, I mean, yes, Optus could have been doing something We've got some similar issues in New Zealand with the definition of the individual. For example, for format sharing, only the yeah. individual can do it for themselves. Yeah, the I think that's, that's uh, why Optus did design it the way they did. Um, I think they would have had a great deal of difficulty if they'd made one copy and ha allowed a lot of people to access it. I think that would have been really problematic. But then it's the definition of the individual. You know, if you, as a family, have an account, 
Um, I don't think that would really make all that much difference because it would just be the account holder and as long as it's being broadcast or being replayed back in the home, it's not communicated to the public. So you wouldn't have infringement in that, that respect. Otherwise, you'd have to watch all of your DVDs by yourself. Uh, that's not, that's, I don't think that's quite what the intention of the, the exception is. Yeah. Um, the point about ownership and Foxtel that people made earlier I think is very interesting. Foxtel have made it clear to me a number of times that I don't own the PVR under my TV, that it's their equipment. Yes. But they also provide mobile apps for me to record shows and apparently on Apple devices you can watch shows via those mobile apps. Yep. So they own the equipment, they make it an automated system for me to record shows and they provide a mobile way for me to watch those shows back. Yep. Um, so yeah, I don't know how they're that different, but anyway. In the Optus case, would it have made any difference if you had to bring your own cloud storage, if you had to bring a Dropbox account, or if you had to bring a Google Drive or anything like that? Oh, that's a $64 million question, isn't it? Um, I, I think it could, I honestly think that could actually be problematic. Um, the ruling is, I mean, you're really looking at the internals of the way that copies are made and who's making the copy. So, yeah, that, that could be problematic. I think that's, that's one of the real problems in this case. Um, we're nearly out of time, so we're going to make this the last question. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I wrote a program called Python iView, ah, which, yes. <laughs> which was subject to its own... Yes, you um, upset the ABC, didn't you? <laughs> yes, its own little um, letter from the ABC. And um, I've, uh, it, it hasn't gone anywhere in court or anything. I've just complied with all the requests, but I've, I've really felt quite helpless. I, I wrote to the Linux Australia Council and the EFA and, and basically the response I got was, you know, too small fry, not enough resources, um, felt quite helpless, don't know, you know, what I can do. So your suggestion about um, writing to my local MP was a good one. I think I might do that, even though I'm in a fairly safe Liberal seat. But uh, do you have any other suggestions uh, for what I could do to make a difference? Well, you can also uh, write to various people in the ABC and, and argue your case. I'm sure you've probably already done that. Um, yeah, I mean, really sort of getting involved in the sort of political area is, is, is probably the best way of doing it. It's, it's, it's infinitely cheaper than litigation. Um, and uh, it does, I mean, there's a lot of cynicism about, you know, lobbying your MP and, and all that sort of thing. But um, You'd be surprised at what a letter from an MP's office to an agency can actually achieve.